Good morning, church. So glad you've joined us. Psalm 145 says this, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. They will tell of the power of your awesome works and proclaim your great deeds. Let's worship him together.
worship, God. We cry out, save us. We cry out, hallelujah. We need you. We praise you, God. All these things acknowledge that you are the Holy One and the only one who can save us, the only one we can depend on, God. So we praise you. We lift you up, God. I ask now, Holy Spirit, that as we look into your word, that you would illuminate it for us, that you would light it up, God, that it would not be a mystery to us, God, that you would reveal truth to us that we've never known before, God, because you, only you, your Holy Spirit can do that. Inspire us, guide us, encourage us, convict us, God, move us this morning as we look at your word. We, again, we just want to declare that we love you, that we long to follow you, and that we need your help, God. We are yours. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We're so thankful for your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome to Canyon Hills. I want to let you know that we sure miss you around here. And right before the message, I want to tell you about the time that Jesus went golfing with Moses. So there they are at the golf course, and Jesus is about to tee off, and he tells Moses, hey, check out what I'm teaching Tiger Woods. So he strikes the ball, and behold, the ball goes into the water. And Moses says, I got this. So he goes over to the water, parts the water, retrieves the ball, brings it back to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, you're Jesus. Go ahead and take them all again. Nobody will know. So Jesus gets ready to tee off again. He strikes the ball. And before that, he says, hey, Moses, just like Tiger Woods, and he hits it. And again, the ball goes into the water. This time, Moses feels a little obligated, so he goes over, does the same thing, parts the water, retrieves the ball, brings it back. This time, he doesn't say anything to Jesus, but Jesus proceeds to tee off again and says, hey, Moses, just like Tiger Wood, he hits the ball again with the same results and goes into the water. This time, Moses says, this time you're on your own, Jesus. So Jesus starts walking over to retrieve his ball, and by this time, a crowd is forming, and he walks on water, retrieves the ball, and on his way back, someone from the crowd yells out, who does this guy think he is, Jesus? To which Moses replies and yells back, no, he thinks he's Tiger Woods. Well, I know that these jokes are getting a little weaker, but it's okay. One of these days, you guys are going to be back in this sanctuary, and it's going to help me out. But aren't you glad... Aren't you glad that regardless of how we do church, we know, and it brings us comfort to know that God, the Lord himself, still sits on his throne. And he is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. Amen. So we're in this series entitled Called, with the premise that we are all called by God to do something and we've been exploring the different ways in which God calls us. In fact, the first week 
we talked about it, and we learn how God calls us to care, and we learn how God compels us by churning the pit of our stomach with compassion. And last week, we learned that God calls us to generosity and explore the, the fact that it, the blessing doesn't lie in the amount that is given, but rather in the actual act of giving. And today, we're going to talk about God calls us to serve. And I mean, all of us, God calls us, calls us all to serve. In fact, this whole series comes from the word kaleo. And in the Greek word kaleo, is probably one of the most significant words in the New Testament. You see, it is the basis or it is the root of 17 other very important words. Words where we get the words like, called and calling and exhortation and implore, comfort, supplication, advocate, intercede, and most importantly, the word church is in there, in there as well. All of these words make up the word kaleo. So it's very difficult to grasp. In fact, it took me a long time to grasp this concept of a calling. For a long time, I thought that the word calling or a calling in my life was reserved for people that were, were clergy or, or for pastors or for the great men and women of the Bible. I never thought that I would use the word called and I in the same sentence unless it was to say that those tacos are calling my name. But yet God has used this church and people at this church to teach me about my calling and how to be kingdom-minded. And it has also taught us to dream big dreams of God not only within these walls, but outside of these walls and into the world. And this morning, I believe in nothing more than the power of God. And one of the things that God has called us each to do is to serve wholeheartedly. In fact, I remember the first mission trip I ever went on. I remember because God planted an idea. He planted a mission in my heart. And, well, I remember it because it was my first mission trip. And I had to go all the way to Ecuador for, the, for that. And again, I felt God speak to me and plant something in my heart. And on that mission trip, I promised one thing after this encounter. I promised that I would take one step into his service if he would open up the path and open doors. But honestly, the main reason I remember this trip, and I will never forget this trip, is because I broke both of my feet on this trip. You see, we were building the mother of all zip lines. And it's a long story, but I broke, I broke both of my feet in several places. And it was actually quite ironic because here I am promising God one step. And literally a few hours later, I break both of my feet. I promised to take one step. And now today, God reminds me every single day that I take a step because it hurts, that it is God who orders my steps. I didn't recognize it at that time, but I recognize it now, that one day this church will get outside of themselves and, and help others and help people and serve and plant churches. And today that dream is more of a reality, but today I want to speak to you very specifically about your calling, your vision for your life. Because, you see, I believe that God has planted within each and every one of us the seeds of your calling. And I believe that if you water those seeds and if you grasp this concept of your calling and if you get a hold of it and you start to serve, there is no stopping you. In fact, you won't be able to shake it. So I want to share a story with you from 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 17. And I know you remember the story because it's about King David. David is probably most famous for killing the, the, the giant Goliath. And I love this story because everyone knows the part about this little shepherd boy killing this giant. What a lot of people don't know is the time between the, when David was called and anointed to be king and the space between that and that great victory over Goliath. What a lot of people don't talk about is this process that brought David from this humble shepherd boy to a great king over the nation of Israel. And I'll summarize that process for you. It was all in an act of service. 
It was a process of working out his calling in his everyday life, even in the mundane things. You know, one day, it was election year in Israel, and the prophet Samuel came to David's house, and he lined up all of David's brothers so that he could choose the future king of Israel from among them. And back then, there was no red or blue states. In election year, God voted him in, and God voted him out, and that was it. And that day, God chose David, but no one else knew that God had chosen or called David. And what's interesting about this part of the story is that David was overlooked. All of his brothers were lined up, and they didn't even make mention of David. And what's, why, why it's interesting to me is because I don't know about you, but I think you might relate, but I certainly can relate. Because oftentimes, we are all overlooked by people in our life. And yet God has picked you out of the foundations of the earth, and he set his eye on you since you were very young, even in those awkward years in middle school when nobody wanted to date you. But of course, I'm, I'm, I'm totally kidding. But he was shaping you, and he was forming you, and he was creating experiences and relationships in your life. And he was even shaping and forming the dysfunction in your family that to bring you to a place, to bring you to a place where he could use your life for his purposes and his kingdom. Now, David wasn't called that day by the prophet Samuel to his house, in his house. He was just anointed in front of his brothers, signifying that he would be the future king of the nation of Israel. And what does David do next? I mean, does he stand in front of the mirror and practice his kingly wave, or does he go to Tiffany and get fitted for a crown? Does he go to, you know, the Neiman Marcus and start trying Armani robes? No, the Bible tells us that David went back and forth to tend the sheep for his father and to play music for King Saul. And I want to read this passage of Scripture quickly for you. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 13. It says, Jesse's three oldest son had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And I wonder, I wonder how many within the sound of my voice today feel that way in your life. That all of David's brothers and sisters were out in the front lines where all the action was, but here's David just going back and forth tending sheep. And I wonder how many of you today in your jobs or maybe even in motherhood or as a spouse or in your staff position feel like everybody else is in the front lines where all the action is and you're just going back and forth what's doing what seems to be very insignificant, maybe even mundane, and all you feel like is you're going back and forth to a job that maybe you even dislike. And I wonder how many stay-at-home moms feel like they're just going back and forth, changing diapers only to change another diaper an hour later. Because, folks, I, I can still recall when my wife and I were changing diapers and potty training and not sleeping well and all that fun, crazy, exhausting stuff that I now see my son and daughter-in-law do with their four kids. They, they look exhausted sometimes. But here is what I would share if you feel like what you're doing doesn't matter, if you feel like the activity that God has assigned you to hasn't come to pass, you don't see it, is irrelevant, this is what I would share, that nothing, absolutely nothing is irrelevant or insignificant in your life when it's done for the glory of God. And my encouragement to you today is that God has placed a great calling in your life. And he has, from the foundations of the earth, shaped you, and he knows you, and he formed you, and he has anointed you, and he has called you to serve. And you're in the space between when God has called you, and maybe even you feel like he put a dream in your heart or in your life, and you feel like you're just going back and forth, and you feel like you're just attending sheep, and maybe starting to smell because you're potty training a three-year-old. 
folks, take courage. Because the most significant opportunities of your life lie in your ability to serve in small ways. I'm going to say that again. The most significant opportunities of your life lie in your ability to serve in small ways. Remember, Colossians 3.23 tells us that whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord. One day, a couple of guys and I were heading down to Juarez, Mexico for our annual mission trip, our construction trip that we take every fall. And we went early because we had to tow a trailer full of equipment and supplies, and we had to go early, and then there was going to be a bigger team arriving at a later time. So we arrive in El Paso, Texas, and right before we cross the border, we stop to eat. So picture this. We get there. We've been driving all day. We're tired. We're hungry. We don't know what's in store for us because we're about to cross the border after that, and with our experience, that could be 10 minutes or it could be literally hours. So we stopped in this hole in the wall, and it's this amazing place, great authentic food, Mexican food, and it's this very interesting place because it's, it's right next to, literally right next to a cemetery, and you have to walk through a bar to get to the restaurants, and these guys that I brought with me had never been there, so they're probably, I mean, I could see the, their confusion look in their face like, what is, where is this pastor taking us? Is he going to, you know, take us to a bar to have a drink before we start our mission trip? But by the way, that didn't happen, but, but I could see the confusion in their face. So we finish eating, we walk outside, and we start talking about how we're going to do to cross this border, and we have now more, a little bit of more energy, and there I see him. Here comes this man heading straight for us. And folks, right away I knew that he wanted to talk to us, and, and at this time I was like dreading because we were tired, and we had plans, and he was about to delay him, but we can't avoid him. And he was heading straight for us. And then he asked this question. He leads by asking this question. What's different about you? Which is a weird question to start with. So I asked, what do you mean? And I don't know if he said this in a profound way because, well, you know, we know, you know preachers do that, right? You know that we embellish or we always make the story sound a little more profound than it really is. I mean, we say things like, I was in an aeroplane, and I was sitting there reading the Word, and the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, and I was sitting next to this man who was, uh, you know, probably doing coke and alcoholic and, you know, a heathen, and he sees me reading my Bible, and he asked, what dost thou read in the Word of God? So I begin to explain the gospel to him and the message of salvation, and behold, he accepts Christ. And the, fi- the pilot hears the commotion from the cockpit, and he comes out, and he asks, Thou, 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 thou speak of Jesus, and then he gives his life to Christ. And then we proceed to parachute out of that airplane into the rainforest and lead an unreached people group over to Christ who are now the executive directors of the Billy Graham crusade. Well, that's how preachers tell stories. But let me tell you, I don't remember exactly how he said it. But this is what he said. I want what you have. And over the next several minutes, me and those guys that we were with led this man to Christ that night. Now, let me tell you what this has to do with David or what this has to do with you. He didn't come to Christ because I preached a great sermon. He didn't come to Christ because he spent years studying the Bible or or maybe on DVD teachings. He came to Christ because we took the opportunity God had put in our hands We stopped, we listened, we established common ground, and we served this man as if unto the Lord. Even if it it was a little unwillingly and tired. We did it with all of our hearts, which is all that we had at the time. So if you feel like you're in life right now with this great calling and that maybe God has planted a dream in you and you haven't seen it come to reality and you know that you are created for influence and destiny and impact, but right now it feels like you're just going back and forth and and doing tedious things and stuck in a job, raising a high schooler who's driving you nuts. But you know that God has called you and you know that there's something more than this. Jesus in Matthew 25 tells us that if you are faithful with the little things, with the few things, that he will put you in charge 
of many things. So here's David, this little shepherd boy going back and forth, anointed to be the future king of Israel, tending sheep in the meantime. He didn't go out and get new business cards to change his title from shepherd boy to king in waiting. He just tended his father's sheep. And one day the Bible says that David's big opportunity came. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 17, the Bible says that one day, Jesse t said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread to your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd, looked up, and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to their battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up the battle lines facing each other. Verse 22, David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Goth, stepped out from the, his line and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. And what fascinates me about this part of the story is that the only reason that David was ever within an earshot of the defiant cries of Goliath and the only reason that David was in a position to do something great for God was because he simply served and obeyed the orders of his father to bring cheese and bread to his brothers. And I never knew that part about King David. I never knew that he got his start by running a charcuterie board over to the front lines. Basically, he was a glorified cheese pizza delivery boy. And the Bible says that he didn't just do it. I mean, this is even more interesting. He got up early in the morning, and he eagerly ran to the battle lines to do the very small thing that God had given him to do. So ask yourself, ask yourself, what would church look like if every single member if every single person who calls this place home started running eagerly to the front lines to do the most insignificant things for the most significant purpose. And you would do it with all of your heart for the kingdom of God. Ask yourself, what would happen? You see, folks, everything we do, every time we serve is significant for God's kingdom, even when we don't know that it's going to make an impact or that it's making an impact. We have to recognize and understand and trust that God will use it for his purpose and his glory. From the parking lot attendants here at church to the children's ministry teachers that week in and week out are faithful to their students, to the ushers and the greeters, you have to know, and I'm telling you, and please know that your job's are important. You are connectors. You are conduits to the power of Christ. About 15 years ago, I started meeting with someone from this church on a weekly basis. And we started meeting with no agenda, and it, and, and it turned into more of a coaching and a mentoring uh, agenda. And, and, and through this process, we studied and we dreamed, and, and now it's about 15 years later, and, and I can't help but feel that every time we accomplish anything, especially when I am part of that, whether it's baptizing someone or bringing them to Christ or going on a mission trip or, or planting a church or, or starting a ministry, I can't help but feel that everything I do is because of this person. That this person is part of that. You see, he poured into me without having to. He served God. He has faithfully done that daily in the mundane things. So I feel like he's part of everything I do for the kingdom of God. So Pastor Larry, I want you to know that I am forever grateful and thankful 
for you sharing that gift with me. I want to let you know that your service to God means the world to not only me, but all of us, but it is paying dividends in my life. But what if every follower of Christ grasped this concept and realize that everything they do, that every time they serve, no matter how small or mundane, understood the impact that it has for eternity. What if every staff member in this church grasped grasped this concept? And what if every single person who showed up on Sundays recognized that they're not just parking lot attendants or greeters or children's care workers? What if they realized that they are staff members of the kingdom of God. What would happen? Folks, I have great news for you. We are opening our doors in a couple of weeks. June 21st is Back to Church Sunday. So we're excited about it. Let me tell you, it was an uneasy decision. We prayed. We've evaluated all the data and recommendations, and we feel that God has given us this date. And we are busy preparing our facility, but we're ready. And you can stay tuned over the next couple of days for more specific. But you see, I don't think that we can ever go back to normal. Because this pandemic has taught us so much. Now, individually and corporately, this pandemic has helped us realize that the church is not four walls. It's helped us to realize that the church is made up of the people, the body of Christ, Christ, meaning you and me. It has helped us realize that church gatherings are probably one of the most undervalued and underappreciated events in the whole world. This pandemic has helped us realize that being a believer of Christ means, and it has to mean, that we have to get out of our comfort zone and we have to step out in faith no matter who you are and we have to serve and love one another. Now more than ever, we realize that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We realize that we're seeing so many injustices in this world, and we realize that there's a lot of need. And folks, the solution or the solutions don't lie in our ability to argue our points or political posturing. The solution lies in Jesus. The solution lies in our service to one another in love, in our actions, and not our words. You know, it's interesting because when this pandemic started, we asked you to consider what God would have you do. We knew that there was going to be a lot of people in need, and we knew that not just the staff was going to be able to carry being able to help. So we asked all of you to consider what God would have you do. What's interesting about that is that that hasn't changed. When you return in a couple of weeks, ask yourself, what would God have you do? Where can you serve? Whom can you serve? Remember that God is preparing you for greatness no matter how mundane the task is. You know, Lou Holtz, the famous football coach, said, when I die, my accomplishments will eventually be forgotten. But what I've I've invested in my players will continue to live on. Do you want to leave a legacy? You want to help change the world? Invest in people. Invest in God's kingdom. In other words, start to serve. And meanwhile... Keep running cheese and bread to the front lines. Keep tending your sheep because God is preparing you for what God has already prepared you to do. Remember that he has called you. Remember that he has anointed you. He has placed a destiny inside of you. And God is going to do amazing things through your life when you serve him faithfully and to the fullest ability of your calling. Plant those seeds, water those seeds, and then marvel at how God makes things grow. May God use you beyond your wildest dreams as a connector, as a conduit of the power of Christ, because you were called to serve. Bow in prayer with me.
Heavenly Father, I am just so grateful for this morning. Father, and like we sang about this morning, I can't help but pray that God break our heart for what breaks yours. Lord, we see the injustices around us. And Father, help us to recognize that, yes, we need to take a posture in our words, but, for, but Father, recognize that action is much better, Lord. Father, may we stand up and may we serve one another in love. Lord, may you allow us to open up this church and that we will never be the same again as a result of coming back together. That we will no longer, if we were, take for granted the ability to come together as a corporate body of Christ to raise our hands and lift our voices. May we just recognize what a privilege that is. Lord, help every single person within the sound of my voice understand that they are called to serve, that you have a specific purpose in mind for them, and that it starts with the things they're already doing, the day-to-day -day going back and forth, tending sheep, Father, maybe running cheese and bread to where they need to go to. Father, we simply put ourselves in your hands, and we ask that you would just help us understand and grasp this concept. May we all rise up to serve you wholeheartedly, Father, and may you bless our efforts, and Lord, may we have the benefit of watching things grow. And we pray these in the powerful and beautiful name of Jesus, and all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you for tuning in with us. I just want to remind you that if you have prayer requests, we know there's a lot going on. We still want to do with life with you with this way. You can email us your prayer requests. We get together every single week to pray over them. So there's a link there that tells you what, what, uh, where to email us those prayer requests. And also, so that you can continue to help us uh, keep this church going and all the activities that we do and our planning and, and all the mission fields that we have, we, we want to remind you, and we're grateful that you are still giving to our church. So if you need a link for that, it's on your screen as well, so you can go to our website. And there's several ways to give. One of them is through our website. And then lastly, I just want to remind you that you guys should get ready, pray, ask what God would have you do, and we're going to see you on June 21st. May the Lord bless you. Mm -hmm.